Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's pop-up installment of Integrating Doctrine and Diversity Speaker Series. This one is moving beyond the box and reconsidering the criminal history question on law school applications. My name is Michael Donnelly Boylan, he, him, his, and I serve as the Associate Dean of Enrollment and Strategic Initiatives here at Roger Williams. I want to begin this event the way we begin all events at Roger Williams University School of Law and take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and we honor the Narragansett and Poconoket people, as well as Soams, the original name on the land on which our campus resides. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if not for the free enslaved labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land on which our campus resides have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of New England, of Rhode Island, and more specifically Bristol, was built from wealth generated through the triangle trade of human lives. During this time of ongoing national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge, and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. While the movement for justice and liberation is building and we are witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who've met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students who will soon be practitioners of law can be and already are agents of change as well. Thank you. With that, let me introduce our moderator for today's event, Nicole Dislewski, who will be, and, and thank her for using her integrating doctrine and diversity platform to host this very important pop-up conversation. Nicole. Thanks, Michael. Welcome to our first pop-up event. Um, Today's event will be all about reconsidering the criminal history question on law school admissions applications. We're considering this a pop-up event, um, one, because it sounds fun, but two, because the topic isn't focused on pedagogy like the rest of our series, but we are so happy to be convening this important conversation today. Um, I'm Nicole, I'm the Director of Special Programs Academic Affairs here at Roger Williams. Um, and today we have a star-studded panel from both coasts. I'm going to take a minute to introduce them. Um, this is a 90-minute session today because it is going to take me a few minutes to introduce them in a way in which uh, even begins to do our panel justice. Um, so our uh, first speaker or panelist is Carmia Caesar, and she is the Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the George Washington University Law School. Carmia is the chair of the AALS section for law school diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging professionals. Gayla Jacobson is the executive director of admissions at CUNY School of Law. Gayla founded the National Consortium of Public Interest Law Schools and is actively involved in the Law School Admissions Council. Lorraine Lolly is the Associate Dean of Student Life and Operations at Roger Williams University School of Law, where she works with senior university and law school administration to support law students in their academic, professional, and personal goals. Lorraine is active in a variety of organizations and is currently the secretary of NELSEP. Mark Ramirez, who is not here yet, um, is a practicing attorney, and likely the reason he is not here yet is because he is not an academic. Um, and he's a public defender in the Bronx. For the last six years, he's represented people accused of all levels of offenses in the Bronx. He advocates for his clients at every level of their criminal case from arraignment through resolution. 
Kristen Thies Alvarez is the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. She is currently a member of the LSAC Board of Trustees and Chair of the LSAC Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. I want to start um, the discussion today by making it clear that today is not a debate with two sides. Um, rather, this is a conversation about a potential change law schools can make to their admissions process, which may have ramifications on schools and students, and also may have ramifications on diversity, both at the legal education level and in the profession of law itself. I don't want anyone listening today to think that the people in this discussion are being pitted against each other based on their school's policies or their role in the institution. Rather, this is just an attempt to have an open and honest conversation about policies which impact legal ed. And a further conversation about why it may be time to change that policy. I hope everyone here understands how importantly all of our panelists view these issues and the accessibility of legal education to all. Kristen, my first question is for you. To start us off, I wanted to share a quote from a 2019 report titled, Unlocking the Bar, Expanding Access to the Legal Profession for People with Criminal Records in California. The report states, the moral character requirement has sordid origins. Its rise was motivated in part by nativist, ethnic and anti-Semitic biases, and it has been used as a means of restricting the admission of black, Jewish and immigrant applicants. As late as the mid 1980s, it was being used by some states bar examiners to deny admission based on applicants peaceful protest activities and sexual orientations. Kristen, can you share some historical background on the topic? Um, a 2021 study stated that 195 of the 196 schools surveyed make at least some inquiry into an applicant's criminal history. Why do law schools typically ask about criminal history on their applications? Why, why is this not just left to character and fitness questions when students attempt to pass the bar exam and become lawyers? Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, Michael. Um, when I saw this question, my first response was, oh, no, no, no big question there, Nicole. <laughs> like, that's not challenging or broad or difficult. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I thank you for the question. I think it's an important one. I do think it's important to uh, locate myself sort of squarely in the admissions and financial aid space. I work in some other spaces too. I'm primarily thinking about this in terms of from an admissions perspective. Um, but in terms of a broader frame and to address your question specifically uh, about sort of the history and context, um, I do think there's a little bit of like a theoretical discussion to be had, um, which is sort of what is professionalism and what is competency. I'm not gonna linger on that, um, but I think it's important to place it there. To me, we mostly agree that we don't want attorneys that aren't competent, um, but we also probably mostly agree that we could really critique the concepts of professionalism. And you see the need for things like the Crown Act um, for, to prevent against hair discrimination and other kinds of uh, expressions of uh, and deployment of professionalism in an exclusionary way that persists to this day. Um, and it is true that anything that sort of sits between those two things like character and fitness uh, is a subjective amorphous place kind of based on old school ideas rooted in concepts that most of us struggle with now, like being mo moral corruption and inherent aptitude that in, then have deeply racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, ableist, homophobic, and frankly, classist roots. Um, so, I mean, I, I, we can go to the historical record. It's an interesting one. I won't go into it, um, but it but it is fascinating if you look at the history of the profession. So what I'm was super curious about is the second part of your question, which is why do we ask? Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about that and also asking other people why we ask. And I have come up with five general responses. Um, and so it's a little bit of a thought experiment, which I would encourage people to think about. If you were in the admissions office and someone asked you, why do we ask this question? What would your answer be? What I have found is that it's usually some combination of these non-mutually exclusive things. 
we, the admissions office, need to be able to evaluate the applicant's character and fitness to be a lawyer. We need to be able to evaluate the applicant's character and fitness, not just to be a lawyer, but to be a member of our law school community. Uh, third, we need to be able to evaluate the applicant's ability or likelihood of being admitted to the state bar to which they apply. Fourth, we need to be sure a candidate is being honest, candid, and complete in their disclosures because not doing so both concerns us generally and implicates the first two issues. And number five, frankly, is just I'm not sure. Like I was told to ask that question. It's been there for 10 years. Um, so the irony for me is that the admissions office is probably the most poorly positioned office in the law school to be able to assess the answers to any of those questions. We're not a state bar committee. Uh, frankly, not all of us are members of the bar, nor are we trained as attorneys. Uh, we admit people from all over the country and the world. We have no idea where they're ultimately going to apply to practice law, nor what that particular jurisdiction might require to qualify for admission. We don't work directly with current students, generally speaking, in a role that provides us with significant insight into student behavior and conduct. We are not the dean of students, usually. Um, we actually can't tell if someone is being honest if they choose to omit information. And ironically, we do invite applicants to update their materials post-matriculation, updates which we as the admissions office might not ever even be aware of, which creates sort of a strange incentive. Um, and then it's not us who certifies students for the bar, nor do we generally keep abreast of year to year changes in that process or requirements across jurisdictions. So you can see that this is not a very good job for us to be doing, and it immediately implicates, to borrow from criminal law, a question of the probative value of the question versus the prejudicial effect of it. Um, so I have thought about this a great deal, and I do think there are sort of four reasons that Often when you dig a little deeper, people start to reach for when asking about why. Um, and one is that they, they start to express concerns about faculty, staff, or student safety in law schools. Uh, two is sometimes there's a strongly felt feeling about uh, there being some act so egregious that no one who has committed them should ever be eligible to be an attorney. Um, the third is that we think we have a consumer protection role and we shouldn't be admitting students who will then spend three years earning a degree and hundreds of thousands of dollars to go into debt when no state bar will ever let them be an attorney. Um, or four, we think that we should be concerned about someone's sort of ability to follow the rules and laws of our society if they're going to be entering into a program that ostensibly prepares them to enforce the rules and laws of our society. Um, I guess the last thing I'll generally say, though, is that I would encourage you to think about each of those things if any of them resonates with you, because in fact, I believe that if we thought any of those four questions were really important, we would actually be asking for different disclosures. If the concern was safety, we would ask for a history of domestic violence, including patterns of arrest without charges being filed, um, assault or other violent crimes. We'd ask about gun ownership. We'd ask about whether someone has ever been the subject of a temporary or other restraining order. If the concern is a bright line at the extreme end of past criminal conduct, then we should ask about those issues specifically and not others. And we should say up front that no one with certain convictions is eligible to apply. Uh, if we think we have a consumer protection role to play, then we should start asking our state bar to create a pre-qualification process that someone whose justice system impacted could avail themselves of before applying, which might result in a preliminary determination of eligibility for membership in the intended jurisdiction. And then we could accept that pre-qualification letter as totally dispositive and not require any further explanation. Um, and lastly, if we think we should be concerned about someone's ability to follow the rules and laws of society, then we should be collecting information about conduct, regardless of criminality, including compliance with orders for child and family support, past debts, filing frivolous claims, drug and alcohol abuse, and so on. And in fact, most state bars ask about those kinds of things, but schools don't, um, which I think it's also suggestive of the sort of role that these questions play that is not actually directly related to any of the cited purposes for them. Um, if I were forced to say why I think we do it, um, I would say that admissions offices willingly or unwillingly are one half of a candor trap. We collect the information in a high stakes situation, the students come and study and graduate, we then complete a certification process for them to apply to the bar and send those admissions materials. The bar looks at it, compares admission materials with bar application materials, 
and if there is a conflict or something that wasn't disclosed, it triggers a, a, an additional process. To me, no other explanation given the structure of the system makes any sense. If we are not setting the trap, the bar cannot spring it. Um, and we might think this is a great way to exclude people who really shouldn't be lawyers. <laughs> or we might think this is a terrible way to extend and amplify the punishments of a corrupted, unjust system. But we should be acknowledging that that's our role um, and we should be exploring how we might challenge it. Thanks. Uh, that was great uh, for a number of reasons, but one is that you talked about sort of a thought experiment. And I had uh, a similar sort of entry into this as I was prepping for this. I thought about, hmm, I teach about mass incarceration and the idea of like, you're not judged by the worst thing you've ever done. The system is set up to allow for second chances. You do the crime, you pay the time, and then you get out and go live a life. And at the same time, like the lawyers being such a big part of the criminal justice system, we're also like saying that's not enough. And here we need to have like another set of punishments for people. And I thought, wow, the same school who is teaching about mass incarceration and prison abolition is also sort of teaching, uh, is also sort of engaging in this practice. And so it gave me sort of a, hmm, there are some things that could be reconsidered um, in, in all of this. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're, sorry, I just wanted to say that if, you're, if people are interested, the National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of Conviction is a great resource, and it currently catalogs about 40,000 official restrictions that limit or exclude people with convictions from accessing employment, education, and more in the United States. Most of us would agree that that's egregious um, and for a variety of reasons, and yet absolutely we are participants in it in a particular kind of way. And I literally teach that database in a required class here at my law school and yet still it took me thinking about it in this way to think hmm maybe there's something problematic about this um so uh according to two authors who reviewed this question in a 2021 stanford law and policy review article aba standards do not require a criminal history inquiry on law school applications instead the aba mandates only that law schools notify applicants that are a, uh, an incident in their past may prevent them from admission to the bar. So wait, sorry. The ABA mandates only that law schools notify applicants that an incident in their past may prevent them from admission to the bar. So this isn't like a requirement. The requirement is actually something else. Um, and so I'm gonna add Gala to the conversation. At CUNY, where you work, the school announced in May 2022, it was removing a question about criminal history from its admissions application, becoming the second law school in New York to do so. Um, can you talk a bit about what led up to the decision at CUNY and at the state bar level and why the decision was made? Oh, you're muted. I saw the sign. <laughs> um, thank you. So there was um, movement on this issue in both New York State as well as specifically at the law school. So I will describe each of them. Um, in New York, it's question 26 on the bar application. And a group was formed in 2021 as part of the New York Bar Association to assess if the question ran afoul of the New York State human rights law. That was at the request of the New York City Bar Association. Um, and so preparing to publish an article in January of 22, discussing the committee's recommendation to actually limit the question, um, we received an email from the work group chair to confirm that CUNY still had not eliminated the question on criminal history. And it was quite fortuitous timing as I was currently writing up the agenda for the next admissions committee meeting. Um, so a year or so prior, I had been approached by a member of our formerly incarcerated law student advocacy association, FILSA, uh, to do an interview on demystifying the law school application process for justice impacted students. And we've been working together on some projects ever since. And in February of that same year, 22, the UTB unlocked the bar, which FILSA members were a part of, produced the case for abolishing the character and fitness process. Um, so I asked our students to attend the next admissions committee meeting to discuss removal of the question. So understanding the racial implications that Kristen's laid out and the effect of being justice impacted has on potential law students, 
but also knowing how important it is, it is to have people who not just know how the system works on paper, but how it works in practice, um, actually defending people who are, um, who are grappling and struggling with arrests or convictions. Um, we really talked about the ramifications that removing the questions would have for our students and for our community. And they were interested in the practicality of removing the question of the application, not so much on the, the heartfelt side, right? We wanted to know what does this actually mean if we remove these questions? Um, so we came up with a list of questions, which were what impact would it have on our students? Would the bar penalize them for not disclosing their history on our application, even if we didn't ask? Would the school run afoul of ABA regulations, which you have um, assured everyone it is not? And would the school be able to adequately prepare students for the moral character portion of the bar? And finally, would there be potential for harm to our community? So the students actually got to work. They contacted each of the appellate jurisdictions in New York State asking if students could be penalized for not disclosing prior criminal history to a law school, even if the law school had not asked. And three of the four jurisdictions confirmed that no, they would not be penalized. One actually went into quite a bit of detail um, and then one did not reply at all. I also spoke with constituents at the law school, the bar support team, registrar, academic affairs, the dean. Um, and one of the things that we learned is that even, or that I learned is that even though Florida bar asks about mental health history, we have a form letter we send when our students apply that explains that we do not ask that question. Um, so there seemed to be precedent for trying to not trying to conform our questions to every possibility from every state and jurisdiction, as uh, Kristen was mentioning. Um, and so that kind of left our final concern, which was, would there be a potential harm to our community? Um, I also spoke with the vice dean of admissions at Buffalo, who had removed the question after Governor Cuomo adopted a similar policy for government entities um, to the newly passed New York City Fair Chance Act which was basically ban the box in 2015. Um, and they had not suffered any repercussions either with admitting students to the bar or with campus safety, though they did still ask the question after acceptance of people who were either intending to live on campus or when they were applying to clinics to eliminate conflict. Um, so we reached out to the clinic dean as well and they indicated that they do not reference the admission application. So ultimately, our admissions committee considered the student findings and voted to eliminate the question on our application at their final meeting in spring of 22. Um, and I think there are a lot of arguments supporting removal that fall into really two categories in my mind, uh, which are the implications on the individual applying to law school and the potential for impact on systems, both to the law school profession and the criminal justice system. So we considered things like, um, we're further punishing those who have already paid their debt to society, which you have both just spoken about. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we fear when we are talking about, you know, is this going to be a harm to our community, to our campus, et cetera, is that people are going to repeat these behaviors. Um, but we find that recidivism is really connected to lack of opportunities, lack of hope, um, and taking away another opportunity and the hope for creating a better future seemed to be counter um, to the idea that we could that we could make that change. Um, and you know, one of the reports that you've put in here, the Stanford report cited that for every one student who's denied admission at the undergraduate level due to the character and fitness questions, 16 individuals self-exclude from even applying due to fear of being rejected to disclosing criminal history. Um, and knowing that the racial implications of our criminal justice system are so vast, that obviously disproportionately affects people of color from being a part of the legal profession um, and of being a part of transformation of the criminal justice system, um, which is so desperately needed at this time. Um, Clearly it is a systemic issue that is experienced disproportionately by black indigenous and people of color. Um, and I think part of me, like my personal experience in admissions is, as Kristen indicated, we're told that we need to ask those questions. We are given sort of a blueprint for what we say to students that have criminal history and are asking, you know, am I going to be judged by this? What do I say on the application? 
our advice for so long has been, you know, take responsibility for your actions and indicate how you won't have this happen again. And like, what if you're arrested for being black? You know, like you're arrested for driving while black, you're arrested for riding the subway while black, you're arrested for walking down the street while black, you're arrested for running while black. It, it seems um, short-sighted to tell people to take responsibility for their actions when uh, we have a system that we know is so intent on um, penalizing those who have not historically had power or have, who, who have historically been excluded for power. So I know I've taken a lot of time, but I just wanted to add that the students played an integral role in making this possible. And I am so excited to see that now FILSA is getting calls from student organizations across the country asking to help them strategize and what are your how to's on moving this forward on our campus. So there is a real appetite for this. And I think that um, one of the things that has felt the most exciting to me about working in um, law admissions in, in my career has been to be able to make systemic changes um, from my vantage point and to, to be able to say, I can be a part of the solution. I'm not just admitting law students so that they can be part of the solution. I can be a part of this too. Um, so I will end there. Thank you. Um... I'm glad to hear that your students are open to talking to students from all over about making changes. Um, I'm glad to hear that you all spoke to Buffalo. Um, I mean, I've seen sort of in reports saying, you know, nothing terrible has happened, but I, I also like to hear it from you that you spoke to them and nothing terrible has happened. Um, and I also like that part of your job can be that there was injustice compounding injustice and you're able in your role at the law school to do something about that. Um, thank you. The criminal history question is one of gatekeeping, as we need to ask ourselves who is being kept out by these questions. T. Andrew Brown, the 124th president of the New York State Bar Association, stated that the criminal history questions on bar admissions application, quote, has driven away untold Black and Latino students who are subjected to the scrutiny of law enforcement to an extent unimaginable to their white counterparts. Said another way, the 2019 Stanford report I mentioned before states, because applicants are screened based on their criminal records, the moral character review process will likely reflect the racial disparities that plague the US criminal justice system as a whole. In turn, such screening is likely to perpetuate the underrepresentation of racial minorities in an already exceptionally non-diverse profession. From your perspective as Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversion, and Inclusion, Carmia, can you share a bit about your point of view on criminal history questions on law school applications? Hi, thanks, Nicole. Um, so, I mean, obviously I'm not directly in, involved in, in the work of the selection, although you did ask for my opinion, which like most lawyers, I'm willing to give on anything at any time. Um, you, you know, Kristen brought up a lot of like the, compart the four compartments of why do we ask this question? And I think um, the sort of in-class response to that in terms of analysis to me is, well, what are the alternatives, right? Aren't there easier ways to accomplish, or are there other ways to accomplish the goals of an admissions committee that are not unduly burdensome? And as a career uh, administrator, right, is it administratively unfeasible, right? Because that's so much when we sit in rooms and figure out policies, is it just too burdensome for us to pull this off? And, and I would say no. I would say that there are alternatives and there's so much brain power just on this call. I, you know, if it were an industry push, I, th I think it is, I think it is doable. I think also that insofar as part of the purpose of the question is to keep the scoundrels out of our community, um, one need only open up the disciplinary page of a law journal to see that whatever we're doing is not working. 
Um, and so you can do that. I can also tell you all of the war stories that are told at my high school reunions because I attended schools of privilege my entire life. And it's, it is, it is striking, painfully striking uh, to anyone that's done even like misdemeanor defense work um, and see that people spend a lot of time in jail for things that are ignored uh, when someone has the power of privilege. And that's without even introducing a racial component. Um, to, to, the, the, to the, the point of the quote that so many people are deterred uh, because of this question, I mean, to me, it's really, to me, it is a, a straw or something heavier than a straw on the back of a camel, on a camel's back. There is so much else deterring black and brown perspective applicants, I think, from considering law school because of how insurmountable a task it, it could be, right? And so in, in counseling people, the who are interested in law school, the obstacles that they face that have nothing to do with the box even. So the fact that this is sort of added as almost a safety net for of exclusion, right? If we could not keep you down with this, with all of these other things that um, compounded the racism and racialized capitalism and oppression and of our nation, we're just going to add this question, right? Because we're going to reach back into the things that worked really well for us, right? Like you having to carry your papers. Um, we're just going to institutionalize that into a form. Um, and, and so to me as someone, and I should probably have said first, I speak on behalf of myself and not on, on behalf of, of the institution for which I work. Um, so many of the battles that we are facing now as people trying to make change, trying to make progress are battles against not the vestiges of slavery, but the components of slavery uh, uh, being being formalized in the institutions um, with which we deal. I, uh, the last thing I'll say is, Nicole, when you mentioned that in your class you teach about these things and then we are discussing them here and it seems somewhat incongruous. I mean, it's somewhat incongruous that we do land acknowledgements, right? That we are saying we're grappling with this history yet here is this piece of the history at the center of the conversation that we're having right now. Uh, and I would also, actually that was not my last lead. So I, I think that's that struck me. That struck me, right? When you said, oh my gosh, this is happening in class. And I said, oh my gosh, this is happening every time we open our mouths and say, this land is not ours and this land was, you know, improved by by uncompensated labor and this 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 harsh um racialized capitalism and isn't that what we're we're doing with the question um the real lastly is in part of my work i i deal with aba standard 303c right that, that our mandate as law schools to give law students instruction twice on uh bias cross-cultural competency and racism well, do we teach them about this? Do we teach them about the standard? Uh, the interpretations of the standards 303B included um, speak about our need to teach law students as part of their professional identity formation, right? About these things. Um, there are other points in the ABA standards that speak to our obligation to teach students about eradicating uh, bias and, and racism within our profession. If that's the charge for our, our accrediting body, then perhaps we have to reconcile um, this, this practice 
and 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 ask ourselves sort of globally even can we satisfy the standard if we are taking an action that is that contradicts the standard as part of our admissions process that was great it took me on a real journey there are parts in what you said that made me so hopeful right we are having this conversation we are talking about this in class the aba is requiring us to do some of this and at the same time i feel so deflated and like the incremental change is not enough um and every time it's just so self-reflexive we just keep looking at ourselves and finding that we are lacking in different ways um but the work is to keep on going um i'm going to kind of sort of ask the same question to lorraine um lorraine you are up next because criminal history questions are different at different institutions it may be helpful to call applicants to law schools or the bar justice involved or justice impacted. According to one LSAC report, justice impact individuals, quote, include those who have been incarcerated or detained in a prison, immigration detention center, local jail, juvenile detention center, or any other carceral setting. Those who have been convicted but not incarcerated, those who have been charged but not convicted, and those who have been arrested, um, end quote. Lorraine, um, the criminal history question on law review applications is a gatekeeping question, and it serves to keep some students in and some students out. Um, as, uh, we, as Kristen mentioned, one common reason for keeping those who are justice impacted out is by excluding or discouraging students who are justice impacted from applying to law schools law students, professors, and administrators may be safer. Can you share from your perspective as an Associate Dean of Student Life and Operations why these types of questions might be important for an institution? You're muted. <laughs> of course I'm muted. Um, so thank you, Nicole. And first I want to just thank you for convening this discussion because it's a really important one. Um, I took it for granted that we asked these questions and um, Kristen started us off in the right direction. Why do we ask these questions? And when I started prepping for the session, I said, well, I'm not sure, or it is about being a lawyer, or what does it mean to be a member of this community? Um, and as a senior administrator and as dean of students, I find myself squarely in this administrative space with lots of responsibility to lots of different bodies. And so I put this question where we have a responsibility to the institution, and that's to our students here in terms of what the community is like, um, who are we inviting into the community. And I'm not just referring to justice impacted individuals, but when we think about admissions, and I've been on the admissions committee at Roger Williams for over 15 years, um, who, who do we invite into our community? What is the um, atmosphere that we're creating? And that's more than just safety, but I will say that there is some feeling among admissions professionals that this does relate to safety on campus. Not saying I agree with that, but at least that's an argument that's been made. The other uh, institutions that I think we consider when we look at these questions are, what is our relationship to the ABA? Um, and we've already gone over the two relevant standards, so 501B um, and then 504. And I think we've taken it for granted as law schools that we have an obligation to ask these questions as part of our application process, that somehow the ABA requires us to ask these questions of our applicants. Um, and that's not the case. So we can see two, two law schools in New York are not in fact asking those questions. And also I pulled out, we went through an ABA accreditation process pretty recently and I pulled out what information did we provide or what was asked as part of that accreditation process. And there's not a requirement that we ask specific questions. The third institution that I wanna say that we have this relationship with is the bar examiners themselves in terms of we are part of the process um, in the gatekeeping or asking the, the history of record about candidates pass. And I love that Kristen pointed out that we're complicit in that process in terms of gatekeeping or the questions that we ask. And so this discussion is the first time that I've thought, 
quite differently about these questions. Um, several years ago, probably about six years ago, as a law school admissions council, we did look at our questions and comprehensively um, evaluated each question, decided what we were going to ask, what we were going to change, and we made our questions much more limited. But it was never even an option or never even consideration that we could not ask those questions. And so I just want to applaud you for bringing us together for this discussion because I feel like I'm complicit in this systemic process um, that needs to be evaluated much more closely in terms of who we're, keep, who we're excluding by even asking the questions. Um, I will say anytime we have um, serious conduct issues, not small ones, but serious conduct issues, one of the things we do is we look at the admissions file and what did it say? What did we miss? Um, is this someone who we shouldn't have been let into our community? And I'll have to say it's not there. Um, that the questions that we do ask about character and fitness are really not relevant to the conduct or don't um, don't forecast the conduct problems that we do that do are raised throughout enrollment and also after they're admitted to practice. So um, I think you said we weren't going to have a debate, but I wonder if I was put here to kind of defend the status quo in terms of keeping these types of questions as part of my as part of the application. But this discussion really pushes us as an institution, certainly, to think differently about what we're asking. One other thing that I wanted to add that I thought was quite interesting was I'm unfamiliar with our undergrad admissions process. And so in prepping, I emailed our, our dean of admissions for the full university to see, do they ask these types of questions? And um, they do, in fact, ask character and fitness questions at the undergrad level for um, non-law school admits. And they they ask specifically about school discipline, but then they do also ask questions about whether or not an individual is justice involved. And so I think that this is a discussion that we certainly need to have as law school administrators, um, but also even just more broadly as educators. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm at the same institution as you. Uh, it, it is not for you to explain or defend. Um, I just like sort of came to the same thing you are like, whose work are we doing? Like, if we're not required to do this, then why are we doing it? Or why are we still doing it? Even if there was a good reason, which arguably there wasn't, but even if there was, is there still one? Um, and you sort of couple that with Carmia's there's already so many things in place uh, with systemic racism or systemic inequality. Why add one more? Um, so I'm just really glad that someone from the Dean of Students is here to like talk about from, from was that knowledge base to talk about some of these issues. Um, my next question is for Mark, who has joined us. Um, this is not a theoretical conversation we're having. It is a very real one for many Americans. According to statistics cited in an LSAC report titled Justice Impacted Individuals in the Pipeline, a National Exploration of Law School Policies and Practices, which Morgan is going to share in the chat, approximately one in three adults in the United States has some form of criminal record. And basing a determination of the risk a justice impacted individual may pose in the future, and in our context, using this understanding to determine who should be excluded from law school and the profession is largely a function of how recidivism is measured and may rely more on policing patterns than on actual criminal activity. Um, Mark, we're so happy to have you here today. Your perspective is likely different than someone in an admissions role or a student services role or even a diversity role in a law school. Your biography states that while in college, you were arrested for drug charges. The outcome of that case was an almost 20 year sentence for a nonviolent first time drug offense committed at 18 years old. While in prison, you vowed you would not let the sentence destroy you or your spirit. You ultimately earned your JD from CUNY um, School of Law with a concentration in social justice, equality and civil rights. And now you work as a public defender. Can you please share about your own perspective on criminal history questions on law school admissions applications as someone who was justice involved. 
Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I was a little late. Uh, and I'm so happy we're having this discussion and I was invited to participate. Um, I mean, <laughs> you can't imagine how many people are, are going to be deterred just by the fact that the question is there, even in uh, undergrad admissions, right? Uh, I was part of a program called uh, the College Initiative, where we talked about this very often, because so many people just don't ever want to discuss it. Think of, you know, the worst decision or decisions in your life, uh, you know, having to discuss those over and over and over again, you know, on job applications. On school. And you think to yourself, like, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying, you know, why, um, why does this keep coming up? Why do, do they want to use this against me? And that's, you, you can't imagine how many people that's going to deter. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, and, and, and if you're in that position, you're thinking like, why am I still being punished? Why, you know, and that's the only reason you can think of why uh, schools would want this information to use it against you again, right? Uh, it's not going to be to your benefit. It's not like the schools are thinking, well, this person may need more support because they have this background or anything like that, right? They're going to use it against you, right? So, um, but what are we really why are we really asking this question, which has been asked uh, by several of the panelists already, right? Um, somebody uses the word, uh, some of the scoundrels that you, you uh, uh, um, would see on, on uh, um, the discipline records, right? So uh, is this asking this question really helpful? I mean, does it actually determine the, uh, uh, any real risk or harm to clients or, or anything like that? And again, if you look at those uh, disciplinary record, you would probably say, no, because there's people who have no criminal history who are constantly uh, uh, going through that process, right? Um, someone else said uh, a few minutes ago that um, our, our kind of uh, uh, view of this is kind of like, well, we've, some schools have removed this question and nothing terrible has happened, right? But what about the amazing things that have happened, right? You know, how many people now who are formerly incarcerated are practicing attorneys, you know, and they're teaching at, at you know, uh, uh, law schools, Georgetown or um, in Washington State, some part of the legislature or other state government agencies. Uh, several of us practice here in New York, right? So um, uh, it's, it's I, I just think the, the perspective, you know, is like what hasn't gone wrong is kind of still the wrong perspective, even on, you know, uh, um, with people who want to do better, who are thinking about the question uh, uh, intelligently and, and um, creatively. But um, I, I, I still think that it's, it's the same way we internalize it. People who are formerly incarcerated who have histories uh, are going to, um, as I said earlier, not want to discuss the, the worst part of their lives uh, but I think it's it's that's just the way it's framed too often for us, right? And as uh, you know, uh, I mentioned a moment ago, with it hasn't gone bad or this hasn't impacted us in a negative way yet. I'm sure is is, is part of that too. Um, and it it just you know it, it's it's um, just very unsettling and, and disappointing. Um, as far as my experience, I knew going into law school. Uh, going into the bar. Um, fortunately, when I applied for, for a job, um, my first job out of law school, it was at an organization that had given me a shot right out, of, right out of prison. So they knew me, they knew me very well. Um, but in applying for uh, the bar and applying for law school, I knew that I had to do more than anyone else, right? I had to do better. I had to be better, right? Because I'm not starting at the same level as everyone else, right? I'm starting at a, a um, a position where I'm looked down upon just because of the conviction. You don't have to know anything else about me. Just if you know that I have this conviction and I'm applying to law school, you want to know more about the conviction. You want to know less about why I'm applying to law school. Um, you want to know why I got in trouble, you know, and um, you want to be reassured that it's not going to happen again. And um, I just, you know, I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the place because it, it's, uh, it is very personal. and. Um, you know, it, it's it's frustrating that it's it's such a big deal, but I do very much appreciate that it's starting to change. And and as I said, so many more people are are 
uh, getting access um, to law school and a law school uh, legal education and the like. And what we bring to the table, though, is that um, as Glenn Martin um, said for a long time, and still says, is you know, people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. You know, me having had this experience, I approach my clients probably differently than someone who has never had this experience, who's never seen the inside of a jail cage, right? Uh, or a prison or, or had cuffs placed on their wrist or any of that, right? I, you know, live that. And I don't necessarily share that with uh, most of my clients uh, for different reasons, but my approach is very different than I think uh, a lot of my colleagues. Um, I'm trying to get back to where we were to questions. Uh, no, I'm, I'm gonna jump in. One, do not apologize. You are here, your whole full self in whatever way that manifests. And if you are feeling like this is personal, um, it is, right? It is. Like much, you were invited here is. today because it is, and you can share what you can and choose not to share what you don't. Um, the second thing is, I think it was great that you pointed out my, the sky is falling thing. Like there is this feeling like if we make a change, the sky is gonna fall that you know, nothing's gonna go wrong or everything's gonna go terrible. And I think changing that mindset to, but what could go right? But how right. many opportunities are we now allowing that we didn't allow before? How are we Especially, reducing recidivism? How are we providing opportunities? Yes. How, all of this, right, yes. Especially if right. we lean more into online education, there are opportunities for people who are currently incarcerated to be able to attend law schools remotely. So, yeah. the, you know, things are changing so quickly right now. Why don't we check ourselves and have the perspective change of what are ways that we could make our profession more diverse? And it's not about what it costs. It's about how much benefit it brings. Well, um, I look at the cost of incarcerating people. I mean, it's, it's, it's a savings. It's a huge savings, right? Um, yeah, it, 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 we, we should be looking at how we can make things better, right? Because um, denying people opportunities is what's going to create the recidivism, right? That's that's the problem, right? Um, and denying them people education or opportunities to grow, right? That's going to uh, uh, increase recidivism. So we should be looking at, you know, how we can reduce recidivism, how we can provide opportunities, because it's not just helping uh, the individual, right? It's helping a community, it's helping a family, right? So, uh, and I think that's that's. The perspective we want to have. Uh, or definitely Absolutely. I think providing opportunities also um, provides or reinforces people's essential dignity as a human. And I think that that like should be the business that law school is in. Um, my next question is for everybody, if everybody wants to hop on. Um, let's suppose law schools stop asking criminal history questions and more justice involved individuals enroll in law schools. The Stanford report lists some suggested student services schools should employ, like developing best practices to ensure that students who are formerly incarcerated or have criminal records are adequately supported while enrolled in law school and providing professional development to faculty and staff to ensure they're equipped to sensitively and more effectively respond to the particular needs of students with criminal records. From your perspective in your various roles, how does a law school need to change to better support those who are justice impacted as law students? Um, Kristen, I'm gonna start with you and kind of go in order. And you know, if you don't have anything to say, you can pass. Um, it's a great question. I'm very curious to hear what others say, specifically from the student services perspective. Um, I'll just say this from the admissions perspective. I think there's a, um, a useful uh, self-study that could and should be done. Um, I have a whole laundry list of what that looks like um, from a previous presentation that I did, but a couple of the questions would be thinking about process factors, like how are you reading these applications? And in particular, does an affirmative response to the character and fitness questions lead to a change in the typical review process, like referral to the Dean of Students or Faculty Committee? And if yes, why? And is that necessary to continue? Um, do you have a written policy to refer to when evaluating these applicants? If you have the question, um, like that includes what factors are relevant and should or may be considered or may not be considered, and are these evidence-based? Um, 
Do you have a non-discrimination statement that includes justice system impacted or similar language? Do you train reviewers of applicants um, to identify and counter bias? And does that include system impacted applicants? Um, do you have a written description for what people should say in an addendum that you're requiring for these affirmative responses? Because frankly, that is, uh, we haven't talked about it. We don't necessarily need to, but that is a minefield for people because we do not tell them what to say. And then we absolutely judge them based on whether they quote unquote took responsibility, whether or not they revealed enough detail and so on and so forth. Um, but maybe the one thing that I would say if you're going to have this question, you want to do anything useful with it. Um, do you collect this data in a way that allows you to track and report on aggregate trends? So for example, like, do you know how many people are applying like you do with how many women are applying? How many of those people get what's the admit rate? How many of them come? How many are getting their aid? How many of them are matriculating? And also, do you, are you looking carefully at what I would call amplification of bias? So one of the things that we found is particularly at a social justice oriented school, which I think in some ways all of us on this call are, um, that sometimes um, white, wealthy candidates actually get a benefit from having a criminal record, for example, for something like protesting, um, where someone looks like they have made a positive contribution by trying to stand up against injustice and other people, it looks, we treat it like a different thing. So being able to juxtapose those two systems. Um, so I mean, I think there are very specific things in admissions context that you could do. Um, and if you aren't gonna ask the question, which I think is your next part, we can talk about that. Great. I feel like I should weigh in as a student affairs professional because I've been thinking about this and we never want to make someone reduce them to their worst mistake. Um, and so it's difficult to decide what information from the admissions office should be shared with student affairs about um, justice impacted individuals. So there is some information through the admissions process that's really relevant in terms of the direct support of students, but I'd really have to give some more thought as to criminal history and how that would impact my ability to give the students what they need to succeed or their opportunities. It does come up in a couple of contexts. So one context is definitely um, our student practice eligibility. And so our local state kind of delegates authority for the character and fitness review to the law school. So we certify whether or not they have good moral character. And so some of that information is certainly relevant I, I would say arguably it's relevant if we're making a determination um, or do we need to ask the question there, I think could be another whole panel discussion. Um, the other part where I work closely with law students is as they're applying for the bar exam and making sure that they have the guidance that they need or we can provide appropriate guidance for the character and fitness process in terms of how to, like you were saying, Kristen, how to make an affirmative disclosure how much information is enough, but not too much? What documents do you need to find? And so that's where having more information about um, criminally impacted students, justice impact individuals is really helpful. Um, Gayla, did you wanna jump in? I do um, actually, just a, a couple quick things. One is um, that one of the things that we were really intent on doing in removing this question was to talk to the admissions committee and do some training on um, implicit bias and racial bias, because one of the findings um, from one of the reports that I think you've already put in the chat, though I don't remember which one exactly, um, was that when the box was removed from employment applications in several states, they found that um, employers were more likely to discriminate based on assumptions about race and ethnicity, um, primarily associated with names. And so it's really important that when you are taking away one uh, piece of information to try and eliminate discrimination and bias, that you do some training and have some education surrounding what um, four implications can come up from that um, removal because the assumption in those cases was, oh, this person is a person of color. They're more likely to have this, but we don't know. So I'm just going to assume that they have been justice impacted or they have had involvement with the criminal justice system. So we really tried to 
make sure that there was some training around that, or at least conversations around that with the people who would be making these decisions. Um, and then the second thing that we've really discussed as a school and have not made progress on is uh, supporting people financially um, and creating a scholarship for people who are justice impacted and what does that look like? And, and I think it was Kristen that was saying like, how do we collect this information and how do we assess for scholarships if we're not asking the question on the application anymore? And at what point do we reach out and have these conversations? Um, and there's a question in there as well about when do you reach out and start to have these conversations? Is it orientation um, in order to prepare for what it might look like um, to disclose on a bar application? Um, at what point do we sort of intervene and have these continuing conversations that we're going to need to prepare for um, near the end? So those are the, the areas that I would add to this piece of the conversation. I, uh... I read this statistic that I sent to you all um, in the LSAC report, Justice Impacted Individuals in the Pipeline. Um, all schools who participate in the study responded, they provide justice impacted students with resources and or assistance to navigate the state bar application and licensing procedure. However, most schools, 71%, do not provide justice impacted students with any other specific student services or resources. And that to me was astounding. So we're asking the question. And then when we admit these students, we are not, what are we doing with that information? And how are we helping the students that we've sort of now added? Um, and then Gaila, your comments uh, sort of made me think about one of the questions in the chat that we can eventually get to about stigma. Well, you know, if we're not asking the question, or we are asking the question either way, how do we sort of deal with the stigma of some of this? Um, Carmia, did you have anything you wanted to add on the original question about um, what might uh, law schools need to change to better support those who are just as, just as impacted as law students? I mean, I could, and I would just be opining, of course. Uh, you know, right now I'm in the process of growing out a first gen support program. And so I wonder to what extent just the underlying theme of first gen support, the demystification, um, the creating a place where people can ask questions that they might not want to ask in other spaces. Um, I just, I, 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 I just keep thinking about the, the elitism of our institutions and, you know, who makes it and who doesn't. And, and if you think a certain way and you have certain resources and have the ability, I mean, I went to law, a lot of us went to law school before externships were a thing. It was more that you walked, you know, to an internship uphill both ways in the snow uh, to volunteer someplace, which someone might be able to do with resources, or someone might just bite the bullet if they didn't have them. So, um, so I guess uh, all I think about is demystification. And as a former civil legal services attorney, obviously I know that anyone returning to the community has an intersection with probably every aspect of civil legal need. And I, um, so, so figuring, you know, I think I would, uh, that's where my heart is actually, that like the, so the web of things and the connectivity of the web of legal needs for people who are in a certain demographic socioeconomically and that being compounded by being a returning citizen um, I don't know how that infrastructure would be built, but I think that's the infrastructure, the re-entry infrastructure that we need. And maybe that should be an office in law schools, right? We didn't have a McKinney-Vento person in schools for homeless children, unhoused youth, until we did. Um, and maybe it's time to have someone that focuses, if we get to this point of getting rid of the box, um, who focuses on re-entry at a law school or at least a university level. 
Um, Nicole, I just wanted to call out at least two other areas where I think this issue comes up in terms of support, and that's in the classroom and in the career development office. Um, we could talk about this from a million perspective. I just wanted to highlight those in particular. Um, there are numerous students uh, who have expressed in particular discussions around the criminal justice system that take place in your very first semester in criminal law um, and that students have said to me felt unnuanced, um, where the students have felt insecure contributing their perspective, um, which then obviously can inform and impact negatively your sort of participation and engagement. Um, and a student who said, quote, she wished her professors demonstrated more sensitivity to the fact that formerly incarcerated law students like herself and other students with prior involvement in the criminal justice system might be present in the classroom. Um, we had another student who uh, talked about attending a private law school in California and who didn't disclose his criminal record when he interviewed for an internship with a law firm, nor once he received that offer uh, after graduation, he was unsure if he should tell the law firm about the criminal record before undergoing the moral character review by the California State Bar and when and how to discuss it. Um, and it was disappointed to find that no one at his law school could advise him on that issue. Um, and so that again, people who are going to go out, regardless of whether we have a box or not, right, we're going to have people in our classrooms that this comes up for who are looking for jobs because our role is to help them enter the profession. And if we don't have someone, I think the McKinney Vento is an interesting example, who's just, it's part of their job title that they're a resource and advisor. Um, it, it becomes really challenging. We've seen this a lot too in California with students who are, for example, are undocumented, where um, of course there are many, many resources, uh, but it requires first you to tell someone who you don't know anything about or their politics or the background or their sensitivity that you are undocumented. Um, and then to kind of figure out which office to talk to and perhaps to speak to a number of different offices and a number of different people, all, for all of whom you might be the first and only person they've ever counseled who was undocumented looking for a job and trying to figure out if they should talk about that and so on and so forth. So I think this isn't the only place it's coming up. And I, I think it's time for law schools to have a discussion about um, sort of the role of identifying key people with this in their name uh, or they're in their title um, and um, making it much more explicit for folks where they can go. Thanks so much for sharing that, um, especially the example about the student and the professors, um, I think that there is such an otherness of, of the criminal justice system. And there is the, the shock and awe of like, what do you mean? Like we have one in our midst. And, and that is so incredibly harmful. Um, and, it, you know, you're right. I think like it, not only acknowledging it, but celebrating it that there are people with different backgrounds and different levels of experience who may have a closeness to the subject matter that we have yet to learn in these three years and beyond who could provide valuable insight. Um, it, and so it, that's a wonderful way of looking at it and thinking about how we could restructure some of the, the people who work here to be more um, inclusive and welcoming um, and not, cut the conversation off before it starts or ex put the onus on the person. Um, Mark, your perspective on specific student services or resources law schools could provide. Well, let me just go back to uh, um, what was just said. I think that goes back to the whole thing about changing how we think about people who are impacted, right? And just uh, from personal experience, I remember talking to a lot of my friends, my parents' friends, my friends' parents, um, and hearing over and over again, you know, like, well, that's not for you. That's for those other people. They belong there. You don't belong there when I was in prison. And it, it's, I think so many people are impacted by, by the legal system at this point that everyone knows someone. Everyone has a family member or a friend. And I think that the vast majority of us believe that our friends or family members are the exception, right? That um, all the other people belong there, but this person just made a mistake, right? And I think that's part of it. That's uh, um, we're, we're, we're conditioned to believe that, right? That only someone that I know and have a close tie to uh, it can, can 
be wrongfully imprisoned or, or uh, prosecuted or, or whatever else. Um, so I think it goes back to uh, um, um, trying to change the, the narrative and, and how we, we look at each other and treat each other, um, just in that sense. In terms of um, support services, you know, it took, I, I went into law school very humble, uh, figuring I would just go and, and try to learn, but there was a lot of unlearning I had to do, right? Having lived my experience, right? And it wasn't just in criminal law or my criminal law classes, um, just understanding the law, the first couple of years, the first year, I'd say, the first three semesters, um, it, it's, you know, there, there was a ton of unlearning and it took me a little while to kind of figure that out and then be able to go talk to uh, some of my professors. And I was, I was, I'm very comfortable talking about my background, um, sharing about my background um, with my classmates and all. Um, so I, I felt comfortable doing that, but I think uh, I'm sure a lot of other people would not feel that comfortable. So we have to create those spaces. Um, and if we ask questions um, and, or make them optional, you know, uh, reassuring uh, uh, um, the students or potential students that it's not going to be used against them. It's going to be used to help them and maybe explaining a little more about how that can be, right? Because so many of us uh, are, you know, worried about the box, right? Uh, you know, because from our experience, you know, it, it's not used to help us in any way. So uh, it, it's kind of going to be a culture shift to, to really see that for schools to uh, um, reassure students and potential students that um, answering this question can be a benefit to you, you know, answering it honestly. And if you don't want to answer it, that's fine too, right? Um, there was something I'm gonna, I'm gonna move um, on to the next question because this is gonna be for everybody anyway. And Mark, I'll start with you. Let's say that law schools eliminate the criminal history question on applications. What impact do you envision this having on law schools, the legal profession and justice? Um, I think we're, we're gonna get um, a lot more diversity. Uh, I, I think we're, we're gonna um, get people who, as I said, are, are um, closer to solutions, people who have lived in the communities that very often we're trying to help. And um, of course, I, I'm a criminal defense attorney, but I mean, this goes to so many other things, you know, whether you're talking about um, housing or, or urban development or, or you know, um, there's just, we can have such an impact, you know, just from our experiences and what we've worked through. And that, you know, um, I worked at uh, the Bronx Defenders before I went to law school, helping people with public benefits. And I realized uh, very early on that the same people I lived with while I was incarcerated, the same people I was helping, not because they had criminal histories or had actually been incarcerated, but people who are existing under crushing systems, bureaucracies and the like. So I, I think we would uh, have people who have a better understanding of uh, how to help people, uh, you know, um, of course, uh, maybe we'll get less corporate lawyers, which you know might be a good thing. I feel, and uh, um, but yeah, I, I think we were going to certainly increase diversity, and uh, we would have uh, a lot more creativity, or we'd have additional creativity. I shouldn't say, um, but yeah, uh, I, I definitely think the profession would benefit from it. And, and think about you know um, all the research tells us that people who are seeking an education um, are much less likely to recidivate. So um, once you've gotten to the point where you can apply to law school, you know, your chances are far more diminished in terms of any recidivism. And you, 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 you're, you're looking to better yourself, better society. So um, I, I, I definitely think that, um, or I know that, um, uh, it's certainly going to improve the profession. I think that it will narrow the gap between lawyers and criminal justice or the criminal justice system and particularly people who are currently incarcerated, the conditions of incarceration. I think that having more people with more experience in the classroom will enrich all of us. And I think we'll have uh, more success at more human dignity in the long run. Um, Lorraine, did That's you right. want to talk at all about um, 
how you envision um, this having an effect on law schools, the legal profession and justice? Yeah, I think my thoughts are similar to Kristen in terms of the example that she used in terms of how classroom dialogue will change. The law is really interesting because the people who need it the most, you're furthest away, away from it. So we have this real in and out um, exposure where, you know, the co common people, regular people will say layman's don't understand how the law functions or what it is, or even how we learn in law school. And how could you pick up, you can't just pick up a book off the shelf and start reading it. Um, and all of that is intentional in terms of how we've structured legal education, how we've structured admissions to the bar. And so we don't evaluate these systems because we don't let others in. And so I'm actually excited about the prospect of having more justice impacted individuals in the classroom because it's the changing demographics that forces the change of the discussions in the classroom. So we've seen it certainly at our institution with the changing um, racial demographics. Like you have to change how you teach based on who's in the class. And so as we invite more people in either as students, as lecturers, or as professors in, in whatever capacity we can, the discussions will naturally have to change. Thanks, Carmia. Um, you're muted. I mean, I, I think what I, I keep thinking, and especially with the last thing that Lorraine said is, gosh, I, I, and maybe this is just an, I, an, an immature view of the way the world should be. Do we really have to change just because of who's in the classroom, right? If, if we are teaching correctly, then shouldn't we be teaching that way, irrespective of who is in the classroom. Is there something that I'm saying that I should not be saying because I don't know that Mark is in my class? Right, like how am I creating the next generation of attorneys if, if, if there's that much restructuring that needs to occur? And then if there is, then, then I think we need to like re-examine the standards again, right? That, that we have to, shift the baseline so that if we are in a place, if we are in a homogenized classroom, then the ideal is that we are, is it just that we comply with these standards or, or we, we teach fairly and we teach honestly because there's someone in there to hold us accountable? I mean, I would like to think that the profession's better than that. I would like to think that the that the, our means of educating the people who go into the profession are, are better than that. Um, and that. And that as people who teach, that we have a, a desire to get to that place, right? That it's not just because there's someone in front of me that I can identify as someone who fits into whatever category, um, but that I am, teaching truly to everyone um, and teaching for everyone. And not that someone who doesn't fit my everyone slipped through and so they're gonna have to take it or leave it. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for in my response, that's that's um, where my I, head I'm, That was the best response ever and I'm tempted to just press the leave button and be like, okay, we're done here um, because where you and Lorraine are is how we ended up with our book and how we ended up with our speaker series. Because I want to be, I want our profession to be where Carmi is at, but I find our profession is where Lorraine is at. And there is this distance. And until we can, you know, fix this, we're going to keep having these sessions. And you all are going to keep getting emails from me about them being scheduled. And we're going to keep asking you to speak because we can't, we all know, well, many of us know that we should be where Carmi is at, but we find ourselves where Lorraine is at. And I think that's the value of what we're doing. Um, uh, so thank you for saying that. Nicole, Kristen. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate the actually the, 
really strong case. I think Carmia just made for universal design in general, which you should do a topic of discussion on, right? Because it's not about accommodating individuals, it's about designing systems in a way that welcomes and um, empowers everyone to participate. But I just wanted to like highlight what I feel like Mark keeps very kindly trying to bring us back around to, which is this sort of reframing away from a deficit model. So I work at admissions and admissions is deeply pragmatic. Like, let's be real, right? Like we're trying to achieve certain goals and they're measured in very practical kinds of ways. And most of us are not you know, deeply engaged in what's going on in the classroom, although we're certainly aware of it. Um, so, so let me just give you a little, some statistics that I think you know, make the, maybe make the practical argument here. Um, first of all, you know, massive numbers of people in the U.S. have criminal records, about over 70 million individuals. That's about a fifth of the U.S. population. Um, according to the Brennan Center Justice Report, as many Americans have criminal records as college degrees. So to risk exclusion of massive numbers of people who might be, you know, amazing, probably are driven, passionate, focused, resilient, high achieving, is just really bizarre right from the outset but also um this is this is not there's no sort of trade-off here and I feel like sometimes it comes up with a lot when we talk about diversity that people see diversity in tension or in a zero-sum game with things like quote-unquote merit um so according to po Project Rebound which is a California state funded program that serves formerly incarcerated students at Cal State University is between 2016 and 2020 their program participants earned an average GPA of 3.0. None returned to prison and 87% found full-time employment after graduation. In 2020, Stanford found that half of the formerly incarcerated students studying at community colleges with support programs achieved a 4.0 GPA during the time of the study. And that more than 80% of those students had a GPA higher than 3.0. So we are also just very strange for us not to be interested in recruiting talented, academically hardworking, focused, creative, um, you know, passionate individuals to come to our law schools. These are precisely the people we should be interested in admitting. Um, and so thank you, Mark, for sort of your gentle, you know, nudge along the way. Um, but I, I do think it's helpful just to keep those numbers in mind, because if you're like me and you're practical and you're an administrator, I mean, I've appreciated both Lorraine and Carmia's sort of definitional positioning of us as administrators and the kinds of things we do, like looking at efficiencies and, you know, administrability of things and our policies. Um, there's every reason in the world to be interested in lowering the barriers and removing the chilling effect that is created by having these questions. I also just want to add from that, I appreciate the pragmatic standpoint and, and the like, let's talk about how um, how admissions actually works in some ways is that we are facing a time when we are expecting national decline in applications on a grand scale. And we're doing these things to try to um, ramp up the number of people who can apply to, to our schools, like taking the GRE or eliminating the LSAT altogether as a qualifier. And wouldn't it be great if we actually just found an untapped body that would help us to create these amazing lawyers that can transform systems because they are so close to them. Like, this almost seems like a no-brainer to me. I have a follow-up question sort of based on where Kristen and Gayla were just talking about and kind of from the admissions perspective, but all of you as administrators and Mark too, should it be part of the mission of law schools to create a pipeline from those who have been injustice impacted to the law school? Yes, and I, I think that includes not just people who are um, formerly incarcerated, but people who have been directly impacted in other ways. Um, think of the, the law student who's going to school because they're a uh, sibling or parent is incarcerated or, or um, you know, who has lived in a household with someone who was incarcerated or removed from the family or the community or just people in those communities where a number of people have been uh, removed due to incarceration and the like. So uh, I, I think we have to look at it broadly, but definitely I think we should be 
trying to get those people into the school. I think it's complicated in some ways as well. You know, um, working for CUNY for over a decade, I get to wear a hat that says, yes, absolutely, let's do this. Like, we have a, a obligation to bettering our communities and to bettering our country and to creating opportunities for children. I think I was reading that, you know, one in nine Black children are, are likely to have a parent incarcerated, whereas um, for white children, it's one in, you know, 36 or something. I mean, the numbers that we could go into here are staggering. And so if we are already in the business of trying to create pipelines for those who um, are lacking privilege, either educational privilege or skin privilege or any other types of privilege, why would we not include this? And in the interest of having this be a balanced discussion that has no sides, I think there are some law schools that are not interested in that and that are not, should not have to be, um, which kind of pains me to say, but you know, I, I, I won't get too specific, but I saw a law school ad that was like, we are one of the most conservative. And I just thought, oh, that's something you're proud of. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Um, and, and, but I need to make space for that to be a part of our experience here as well. Um, so I don't know that it's the obligation of every law school to be involved in creating pipelines, but I do think that for those of us that are interested in access missions, that for those of our, us who are interested in social justice, um, for those of us that have, you know, commitments to um, diversifying the law school profession or the law legal profession, um, yes, absolutely. Kristen, Lorraine, or Carmia, do you want to jump in on this one? It's interesting because I would say that we, you know, as an institution do have an interest in working with those that are criminally, that are justice impacted. Um, and, you know, I can think of students, you know, right off the top of my head who have served significant amounts of time, time in prison or have criminal histories who've come to our law school and we've embraced them. Um, you know, that's part, it's not always a negative thing. It might be something that makes us want to have a member of someone in our community. Um, but I'm struggling with how that is not, does not square with us asking the questions and the deterrence effect. And so our intentions and our desires to be um, inclusive um, does not match with what we're doing with our admissions questions. And so we need to reconcile that as an institution. Okay, does anyone have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, so you, you've cited the Stanford study a couple of times. And um, fun fact, I was actually at the round table at Stanford Law that you're referencing that resulted in that report. Um, and I think one of the most surprising and alarming things for me that took place there was a very casual statement that someone who was a leader in the state bar, bar said, which was not a negative thing, but they basically said, yeah, well, I mean, eventually everybody gets admitted. And it was so nonchalant. Um, and, and there were attorneys, right, who this is their whole area of practice, helping people who are system impacted navigate the bar process. Um, but it was, it, it occurred to me that like, um, you know, yeah, because you could, they tell people like wait for a year and don't have any problems and then reapply or they have a committee and there's a back and forth and they take a holistic review or you might need an advocate. We've certainly seen people who had to take it all the way up to the California or to the a, a state Supreme Court, for example, I mean, where the fight was fierce, but basically that like we just make it really, really hard and expensive for some people. Um, but if the result is that anyone who's willing to like sort of suffer and persist through that ultimately does like how strange of me to be an additional layer which only serves to make it slightly harder given how hard it looks at the end and how likely someone is to ultimately overcome it 
anyway. Um, but also certainly there are people who are way more qualified than me making these assessments according in accordance with their rules and that I don't even know those rules particularly well and I'm sort of not asking questions that would help me understand them. Um, the other thing is, uh, just on a personal note, uh, you know, I I think a lot of this came to a head for me. Gayla and I talk a lot about how, raising our children. Um, a lot of this came to a head for me because I have three sons, and the middle one is difficult um, in a variety of ways. And you know, not that long ago, um, I got a call from the local Target that he'd been caught shoplifting, and I say caught and not arrested on purpose because. The security guy called me up, asked me to come down and get him, said he was a good kid, he, so they didn't need to call the police, not like some other people. Went through his backpack, found a bag of weed, said, hey, you need to get better weed, and put it back in his backpack, sent us on our way, and then I got a demand letter a week later for a $500 penalty that we had to pay, civil penalty, if we didn't pay within five business days, it would be referred to the police. Um, so my son doesn't have a criminal record because he looks like a good kid. He's from the suburbs. We have financial resources, access to mental health care, services at school, a parent with a law degree, and so on and so on and so on. And people often refer to this as students who have a, or individuals or children who have a safety net. But I prefer to think of it as an airbag effect because let's be real, a lot of kids crash. A lot of our students are abusing Adderall during finals. A lot of our students have engaged in conduct that we know nothing about and would be horrified by. But only some kids get to walk away unscathed without lifelong injuries. And that's, I think, the, the difference that we're trying to address here. Um, that combined with the clear statistics that show that just having the question is enough of a reason for someone not to apply, to me, makes this a very easy case. I would just um, say to anyone that's considering removing the question, number one, reach out to me or to um, our student organization or, or anyone else. But the one piece of advice that I do want to give you in going through this process is that you are going to have pushback. Um, but what I found, which was really interesting, is that for many of the departments that I met with, many of the people that I met with on an individual level, there was like almost a disconnect between what they wanted to believe and their initial reaction to the removal of the question. Like, I know this is the right thing to do and I want to do it, but I'm scared or I'm fearful or I'm concerned about these impacts that it might have. And going back, giving space to go back to them later so many people were like, you know, I sat with it and now I feel good about it. Or, you know, I, I considered these issues and, and I questioned why I was having that reaction. And I'm so excited that we were able to do this. And so understanding that initial setbacks or initial reluctance is not, um, is not a roadblock or is not um, going to prevent it from, from happening altogether. Um, I think there's there's always room for hope that there will be um, progress and changing of minds. And if there are not, um, Ibram X. Kendi has said that um, following policy change, people realize that nothing bad has happened and then don't care. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I want to close. Oh, Carmel, go ahead. Before yeah. I close, Carmel. <clears throat> I was just going to say that if our strongest argument is that it it, it disproportionately impacts um, black and brown people, then that's not our argument. That's not our winning argument because I think our history um, really <laughs> shows that that's not compelling to decision makers, and that we really do need to look at sort of places of of interest convergence that. Um, that don't rely on the hearts of good people, uh, because I think um, those hearts often do the wrong thing. And on that sobering note, um, I want to announce our final session for this academic year is happening next week. Um, yes, we are doing this in back-to-back -back weeks. It is a one-on-one -on -one sit down with Dean Erwin Chemerinsky on the topic of responding to classroom controversy it will be the 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern. 
Um, thank you so much to our panelists, Carmia, Gayla, Lorraine, Mark, and Kristen. Um, we started planning this in the fall and we finally got it together right before school ends because everybody has the busiest schedule. Thank you so much for being able to do this today and allowing us to record it so it can live on. Thank you to our sponsors, RW Law, CUNY Law, GW Law, Berkeley Law, and Jurist. Thank you to our behind the scenes team of marketing and promotion and technology, especially Chelsea and Morgan. Um, and we hope to see everybody next week.